How's it going? Good. Go, How are you? Go, go, go Phoenix. <laughs> always, always. Yeah. Thank you uh, so much for joining us in the middle of the schedule. Uh, do y'all have a game today? No game today. So oh. yeah, yeah. But game I, yesterday and game tomorrow. Oh, okay, okay. Because I know uh, the 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 COVID uh, cancellations has has hit here in Chicago. Uh, the Celtics uh, had to cancel. Yeah. Celtics were going to play the Bulls tonight. Yeah, the Bucks play Dallas on Friday, so we'll see. Um, Dallas had to cancel their game yesterday, so we'll see if that affects them at all. But you know, it's it's a day to day, like we all have been for you know almost a year now. So we just adapt, right? <laughs> right, absolutely. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So uh, I'm going to introduce you uh, right quick, and then uh, we'll jump straight in the Q and A. So, so we can um, better um, economize your, your time, especially uh, with the Bucks not playing today. I know you want to relax for, for a second and everything. So we want to uh, be mindful of your, your, uh, your, your time. So joining us today is iconic Emmy Award winning sideline reporter for the NBA Milwaukee Bucks and the, the greatest basketball player in the proud 131 year legacy of North Carolina's Elon University, home of the Lady Phoenix. Let's give, <laughs> let's give a Hiding huge me up today. <laughs> let's give a huge warm South Side of Chicago welcome to the legendary Zora Stevenson. All right, and uh, joining us today, uh, we'll be having uh, some students from uh, Thornwood High School, uh, hopefully joining us. Uh, we're experiencing uh, technical issues, but we also have uh, students from uh, the Barack Obama uh, Learning, uh, Learning Academy out in Hazelcrest District 152.5. We see you, Coach DeLoach, who, who is the, um, on top of the mini hats that she wears, she is also the girls' basketball coach for the for the Barack Obama Learning Academy Eagles, Lady Ooh, Eagles right. in the house. That's right. That's right. <laughs> welcome, welcome. Thank you for um, taking time out to speak to the students today. We really do appreciate it. And um, I just want to let you know, I have more students, but it happens to be their lunchtime and food, Zoom, and you know, so they're slowly. I understand. Trying. So I do apologize. So they're slowly trickling in. And then, um, and then we'll have additional uh, students from um, uh, William uh, Carter um, uh, School of Excellence um, on the um, south side of Chicago as well, joining us um, shortly. So thank you uh, so much, uh, Zora, for joining us. Um, um, before uh, before we go into the Q and A, what was your what was your um, career high at, at, at Elon. Um, you broke so many records um, <laughs> over there. Um, do you remember your career high? Yeah, no, I, you know, you guys are too generous with all this hype on my basketball game. Uh, you know, I had one role and that was to shoot the ball and, and I uh, did it to the best of my ability. My career high was 28 points um and nine threes so that's that's as far as i got yeah <laughs> so 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 was you out there um for for the bucks uh, uh record-breaking uh, uh three-point barrage <laughs> in miami then i was not in miami but i was definitely we had a broadcast that day and so we were live on air when it happened so awesome awesome to see hey i mean like the hot hand is contagious i i wholeheartedly believe in that and once one person gets going, everybody else starts to feel it. And it gets con contagious. And surprisingly, <laughs> the only person on the Bucks that did not uh, hit a three was was, was your back-to-back -back MVP, Giannis. Yeah, you know, I think there's a lot of ways you could look at that. But, you know, to me, it's like, what does that say about the team and the how depth. talented they are? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. How, um uh, Coach DeLoach, did, yes. uh, I think you have a couple of students that, that are uh, ready to ask. I'll pass the mic to you. Yes, yes. Abigail, can you go ahead and ask your question, dear? Stop covering your face. Let's get, get over it. She's here. We all here. It's all good. Go ahead and ask your question. 
Um, who gave you your first ever news break? Say it again, dear. Who gave you your first ever news break? Oh, yes. Great question. And, you know, I always tell people it only, only takes one yes. So don't be discouraged by all the no's. The no's are normal um, and they're going to happen, but it just takes one yes. And so I got my first chance at an on-air gig in the news industry from uh, a woman named Stephanie Schultz. And this was in Greenville, North Carolina, right after I graduated from college. And based on an internship I had, my name kind of got passed around and she reached out to me and she kind of gave me my first shot. And so, yeah, that's how I got my first professional opportunity on air. Excellent, excellent. Terrell? Go ahead and ask your question, dear. What are your duties and responsibilities as a sports anchor and sports reporter? Oh, yes. So uh, let's talk big themes here. My role is as a sideline and digital reporter for the Bucks is to tell the stories of the team, who they are as people, who they are as athletes, what they're involved in, and then obviously all the X's and O's on the court. Um, and how that manifests itself kind of line by line is on game days, I ask questions at all the press conferences. I do different on-air uh, presentations for the pregame show. During the game, I do different on-air reports. I do interviews during the game with players and coaches. And then on non-game days, I'm doing even more interviews so that we have stories to tell during the game, kind of preparation and things. Constantly researching, writing down notes, um, getting to know the players so that they're more comfortable when we're in the interview settings. And then as my role with the Bucks and the digital reporter, I do a lot of hosting for the team. So if they have season ticket holder events or, you know, they just debuted their city edition jersey and I was the voice behind that commercial. So just various things mm -hmm. with the team. So it's kind of half journalism, half host slash voice of the Bucks. <laughs> nice. That's a, that's a lot. <laughs> yeah, for sure. For sure. Michael, do you have a question, dear? Michael Clay? Like Mike. Mike, did you leave us? Abigail, can you ask that question? Um, who is your journalist growing up? Who's your favorite yeah. journalism, journalism teacher growing up? Oh, so, you know, I have one that, um, a professor that um, is kind of like a mentor turned friend. His name is Rich Landsberg, who really was, I'm big on honesty and, and that kind of tough love and telling me like it is. And so he's always been that way and been realistic. And then my first journalism teacher was in high school and her name was um, Lisa Lynch. And she just kind of, you know, let me take the reins of our morning show in high school. So I kind of have like my first journalism teacher who really gave me an opportunity to just go for it. And then a mentor um, professor that's kind of turned into somebody that I lean on in my professional life. And so, yeah, that's, that's how I would answer that question. Awesome. Uh, Terrell, I'll, go ahead. Oh no, go ahead. Go ahead. I was just asking Terrell if you had another question. You have to unmute, babe. Terrell, can you hear me? Yeah, I, I was trying to think of a question. Oh, how, <laughs> okay. How how long how long did you work in Denver, Colorado, before coming to Milwaukee? So I was in Denver, Colorado, for like a little over two years. I think it was like two years and three months. And so I did mostly news there. And by the end of my time there, I was anchoring. And then on the side, I called basketball games. So did a little bit of everything um and denver is like home to us now we love love that city um and miss it dearly yeah oh wow so, so obviously you covered the nuggets uh mm -hmm. colorado rockies denver broncos yeah i covered all them but honestly nuggets. it was it was honestly more so news um oh okay you know, oh, okay sometimes okay. like i would i did a story on like Philip Lindsay and his sisters and his family and how everybody played 
um, oh, yeah. some sort of sport, sport at the, the college level. So I did stories like that, but I wasn't like at practice every day or anything like that. It really was the hard news and what's going on in the city. So, you know, I always like to tell people where everybody's running away, I was running towards it. Um, you know, whatever big event was happening in the city that day. So I was, I was mostly hard news. Yeah. Mm. What, what is it like to uh, cover such a global superstar such as uh, Giannis uh, Antetokounmpo? Antetokounmpo. You know, yeah. Um, I guess I don't realize the uh, magnitude of it all, right? Like, I don't, um, I'm not a fan necessarily, right? It's my job to cover him. And so just how I would cover, you know, your story, that's how I see I have to cover Giannis. And so mm-hmm. I like to think of people everywhere, all people, and we all have different stories. And yes, I happen to cover this huge superstar um, that is larger than life to so many people. But at the end of the day, like he's Giannis, he's, you know, a person just like like all of us. And so um, I think that helps too, because when I'm talking to him, I'm just talking to another person that I respect. um, And, and definitely he's an inspiration for so many different reasons. Um, But I guess I haven't reflected on how big it is and how big he is that we get to have conversations day in and day out. Yeah. I think that would make it easier for you, though, if you, that's like you're comp, comp, um, compartmentalizing it, like, okay, this is not, oh my God, this is, this is my yes. job, let's take care of this, and then maybe later, you're like, do you realize who I was just talking to? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So make it a little easier. You know, sometimes I think there's those pinch me moments in the NBA. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, for me, it was like when I got to interview Kareem for the first time, or Oscar mm-hmm. Robertson. Yeah. Um, but because I'm in the day to day with the people on the team now, I don't really have time to like, you know, mm-hmm. have like a fangirl moment, so to speak. Yeah. So I respect them and, you know, we all work together, but I'm sure, uh, in, in the years to come, I'll reflect and say, dang, you, you were there for like some of the big moments for right. such an iconic team in person. Good. Do you take pictures? I mean, not just necessarily like not fan pictures, but just pictures just to kind of document where you are. Yeah. Okay. Good. 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 All the time. Yeah. Especially this past year, you know, there's so much reflection um, mm-hmm. on who we are and what we what we stand for and what we care about, and so just reflecting good. on all I've done. Yeah, for sure. All right. Is is Giannis like truly like like I've obviously have not never met him before, but he just seems like the most down to earth uh, person in the world. Where um, and touching upon that. I, I think like two, almost two years ago, uh, playoffs a couple of years, during the playoffs a couple of years ago, it was like a huge story that uh, that uh, Giannis and and I think his girlfriend was uh, waiting in line of, of a burrito uh, spot uh, <laughs> back in Milwaukee and, and he was waiting in line, Giannis of all people, for like about an hour and a half and then it it just made national news that nobody recognized who who was in line all that time. Um, do you remember uh, that story? I do not remember that particular story, but I'm not surprised by it at all because, you know, obviously, like, like we keep touching on, he's this larger than life person on the basketball court. But once he steps off of it, I mean, now he's, you know, he's a partner, but he's a, he's dad, right? He's a brother. And I think that's, you know, for all of these athletes, right? Um, they're, they're so amazing at what they do. But once they step off of it, they go home. Their families treat them just like family and how we treat our families. And so they're humbled in that way. And um, yeah, it's just, it's, you have conversations and you just realize like they, obviously different circumstances for, for how they live their lives. But at the end of the day, human to human, right? And so a lot of the things that we all go through is the same things that they go through and yeah I think all of us kind of have to remember that when we're watching them perform on this magnificent stage yeah I think uh, Michael Clay Jr. has a question what is the hardest yeah. part of your job Ooh, depends on the day right uh I would say hardest but where I have to think the most the walk-off interviews it's just you know the, the game is happening and you could have a thought for what questions you want to ask like in the second quarter and obviously everything changes in the fourth quarter and so that's where like most of the 
ideas for your questions come. And then you may have some ideas with like two minutes left and the game could completely shift. So you have to be able just to react and adapt and adjust. Sometimes you think you're going to get one player and you get a different player. So it's just kind of moving on the fly. Um, So walk-offs are definitely, but that's like the best part of my job is that adrenaline rush and just kind of performing at a moment's notice. Um, It's different now. We do all of our like group interviews with like the the masses of the press over Zoom like this. But before you had to like kind of nudge around and get a word in and pick your moments so that the the player would kind of touch eyes with you and answer your question versus, versus another person. Now we kind of get called on, so it's much more civilized. But um, yeah, so I I think there's all these different parts of it that, you know, you just really have to think and and, um, really be on your P's and Q's. But that's what I love about it. I mean, I once had a mentor tell me, like, if that tally light comes on telling you that you're on camera and you don't feel something in your gut, then maybe it's time to think of something else, right? Mm -hmm. Um, Just to realize, like, you got to be in it. You got to have a passion for this. Um, And for the craft and for telling stories, I love writing um, and I'm hard on myself when I write. So that's, again, it's fun, but it's, it's also another thought provoking task that I, that I have to do. So I would replace the word hard with, with thought, thought process for sure. And, um, and before, um, before each game, um, obviously uh, you're employed by the Bucks, but um, do you also, um, are you also tasked to uh, study the, the opponents? Like, for example, a couple of weeks ago, uh, when the Bulls came into town and 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 y'all torched us by about forty <laughs> points, uh, <It> <laughs> you had bad. to do like research bad. on like Zach Levine or Kobe White or you know uh, like like the opponents uh, players, top players. For sure, have to know who they are, what their tendencies are, and then more so like how the Bucks are going to adjust their coverages to match up with them. And then there's always connections on teams. You know, for example, one of the assistant coaches that you all have with the Bulls, oh, yeah. you do with the Bucks, yep. Josh Longstaff. So, you know, bring, bringing fans up to speed with that. He's um, going to be a coach very soon. He's going to be a head he coach is. very soon. He is a great, great um, coach and, and human being. I have a lot of respect for Josh. And um, so, yeah, I, I've got to know everything. And I have to know what's going on around the league, too. Now, it may not manifest itself for you to see me reporting on it. But, but you, but you never know. Exactly. And context is everything. And so yeah. I, in order to formulate the right questions and the right reports, I've got to know all the different moving pieces. Mm-hmm. It, uh, it seems like Chris uh, Middleton, I, I, I think, uh, especially the way he's played this season. I, I know last, last season he was a, he was a uh, all-star. And yeah. I think, I think this year, like his overall play, especially on both ends of the, of the court, uh, he's been getting at it on the defensive end as well. Um, his three point, I mean, he's uh, more, even more of an all around player. Uh, do you think Chris Middleton is ready to ne- take that next step um, to, uh, you know, um, you know, to assist Giannis and, and uh, lead the Bucks to the championship? Hundred percent. I mean, in my opinion, a guy that's last season averaging over twenty points a game and right on the threshold of fifty percent from the field, forty percent from three, and ninety percent from the free throw line, which only eight players have done, even less have done it while scoring twenty points or more. I mean, he was already there to me, right? You said it. He's already an All Star, and so I think he deserves a lot more recognition than he gets. And this season, he's scoring more points. Um, and his percentages are right up there as well. It's just about maintaining and consistency. So sky's the limit for Chris. And yeah, just his ability to score anywhere on the floor should definitely be appreciated by fans. Mm-hmm. And um, how important was it to um, bring back uh, DiVincenzo and obviously uh, getting getting Giroux? I, I know the trade with uh, Bogdanovich uh, fell through, but Fortunately, DiVincenzo was able to come back and then getting uh, Drew Holiday uh, from the Pelicans. Um, how important are those, are those two moves in um, moving forward? Yeah, Dante DiVincenzo is a huge part of the puzzle, and he's made his way into the starting lineup in his third year. And last season, he like started 20-plus games, and so he's already familiar with Brooke and Giannis and Chris and how they play and then you add in Drew Holiday to the mix and you've got 
multiple weapons, right, and multiple pieces on the floor at the same time. Brooke has the ability to back you down, but also shoot from the outside, and he's so vital to their defense. Giannis speaks for himself. We've talked about Chris. Um, Dante is this, you know, tenacious defender that gets in passing lanes and gets deflections, and then he's athletic on the other end. Beginning of this season, he was shooting lights out, uh, and then Drew Holiday can do a little bit of everything. Thing. so I think it's it's a great balance and the moves um, all made sense and it's really showing on the court it's going to take time for everything to come together and you know I don't know when we'll see another like 18 game win streak like the Bucks had last season yeah. but um, you know it definitely all makes sense and things are starting to gel for sure how how is the cap space uh, looking like for the Bucks to to maybe um, make a, a veteran move at, at the trade deadline and in, in uh, you know, next month. Um, or do y'all have a uh, cap flexibility to maybe uh, bring, bring a piece in uh, coming off the bench? Well, not a ton of space necessarily, but they do have a 14 man roster, which means they do have a spot open um, for, you know, someone to come in and contribute. So that's something that the front office is, always thinking about I'm sure it's it's a part of their daily conversation so you know mostly I cover things that are happening on the court so to speak and um, let the front office kind of do their job and yeah we kind of we go from there but we'll see what happens and uh, th this is a question um, pretty much for uh, coach the loach and 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 her uh, lady eagles yeah uh, basketball squad do you have any um, health and fitness exercises that you suggest uh, for, for uh, basketball players, student athletes to mm. uh, execute, especially in this time of, I believe 90% of the country is still uh, doing remote learning. And, you know, just, just to get the kids up and about, uh, continue that, that activity. Uh, what are some basic exercises with you being a basketball legend yourself <laughs> um, to you know, for for students to uh, execute. I just tell the students to keep moving. You, you have to keep yeah. moving. Don't just you know we're sitting in front of the TV or the computer six, seven, eight hours a day. To close it down and go outside and do something. You don't have to go anywhere, but just get out and move about. Um, just stay moving. And if you can do some push-ups on along the way, some jumping jacks, get the heart moving great but it's hard because it's hard it's hard for me it's just hard to just be motivated to actually do something so just keep moving that's what i've just been telling them i also think all of us in the midwest are at a disadvantage right in the summer mm -hmm. it was all nice like you, can, yeah. you know you can go outside and yeah. just walk around go on a run whatever floats your boat and now like dang it's cold so <laughs> and i know like it hasn't even gotten that bad yet but the motivation to want to yeah. go outside when it's yeah. 30 is yeah. much different when it's like in the 50s and 60s, right? <laughs> and, and you can't even say go to the store and walk around because you don't necessarily want to be in the store. Yeah. You, know, you just want to, you know, so go outside, walk around your house a couple of times. It's just kind of like, yeah, no. So just get up and do something other than being on the computer. For sure. What, how... How it, also for the students um, on the call, how important is it uh, working at a smaller market first to gain that necessary experience before jumping into a big market uh, news opportunity? Everybody's path is different, but for me, I feel like going to a small market was so beneficial because I had an opportunity to fail and get it wrong without major consequences, right? Mm -hmm. And I had the opportunity to do a little bit of everything. So for example, when I was working in Greenville, North Carolina, my first on-air job, I got to cover high school football. I got to fill in and anchor sports. I did news. I anchored news. I shot, wrote, edited everything. Like I covered education, I covered crime, I covered politics, you name it. I go to Denver, the 17th largest market in the country. And it's like, no, you cover hard news, right? It's a more specified category. And um, that should ha that's just how it is when you get to these bigger stations. And so that's why I think going to the smaller stations so you can figure out what you're good at, what your kind of niche is and, and what you can excel at is, is very helpful, especially when you're starting out and trying to figure it all out. 
It also makes you a better worker because you're uh, more well, well rounded. Say, for instance, the editing guy is sick that day. You're like, hey, you know, I know a little bit. That, mm -hmm. that makes it more profitable to them. Yeah. Exactly. For sure. What? Um, I'm sorry about that. What? Uh, what did you major in at, at Elon? I majored. It was under the communications department, but the specific like title was media arts and entertainment, um, but it was basically communication. So I technically didn't even major in journalism. I really wow. learned all my journalism skills and um, principles through student media. Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. Rather than in a classroom setting, yeah. What was, um, what was your initial reaction uh, when you found out you won your first Emmy? <laughs> Uh, it was a really memorable moment at night. My mom and husband were there. And uh, yeah, according to my husband, I screamed pretty loud when they called my name. So <laughs> it was a really great moment. And I, I, to me, it's it, obviously it's about the award, but it's just um, it's more of we, you know, only you know how much work and how much time and effort you put into your craft and so to be recognized for it means a lot. And I am, um, I'm so big on, on telling other people's stories. It's all about other people and amplifying their voices. And um, I don't take that responsibility lightly. And so I don't know, I was just overcome with emotion for a lot of different reasons, but just because of the respect that I have for the craft mm -hmm. and, um, you know, how much, how much is, you know, become a part of who I am and what I believe in. And so again, just to be recognized for that meant a lot to me. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and and uh, once again, we have uh, uh, Miss Franklin from um, from William Carter School of Excellence uh, in the house on the call. Thank you for joining. Uh, let me know if you have any addition, any uh, questions before um, before we close. Before Definitely. We, close. Uh, we appreciate you. We are on Google Classroom. And so that's the platform that my students use. And so there's about 28 of them online. Uh, I'm sharing my screen so you can't see them. But they can see you. So I can do Zoom, but they can't. So just they're waving at you. They, they've already researched you. Um, and so they're in the chat box now talking about your accolades. And it's, it's really inspiring. Um, but I do have a question if you're comfortable answering it. Um, we're discussing just different like um, events and different means of discrimination that the students have experienced and that we've seen throughout history. Um, even today, we were talking about the 1963 boycott of Chicago public schools. And we're just talking about like how discrimination has embedded its way into our country's history. And so just um, a personal question, if you're comfortable answering it, have you ever experienced a time being discriminated against uh, while you were working? And if so, how did you handle it? And do you think there's something that we can do about discrimination? In my experiences, I have not had anything that was in plain sight. And what I mean by that is something that was so to my face, like, Zora, you're not getting this opportunity because you're a female, because you are Black, because X, Y, and Z, right? I, I've never had somebody, you know, that uh, blunt. But um, what I have experienced is those undertones, right? And, and things that aren't so obvious. Uh, you know, you, you get a job, right? And everybody wants to grill you. Like, for example, you get the job with the buck and everybody is like second guessing and looking up your highlights to make sure that like you actually played you know um or grilling you on on history of the team just to make sure that you know what's going on when they wouldn't do that to somebody that's of you know a different gender or or a different race um or you know me even just sometimes I put I almost like do it to myself and like I wonder like if I you know change my hair or my appearance or my look would it be accepted the same and nobody said Zora like you have to wear your hair this way um, or you have to talk like this or act like this but you just look at the line and, and who's done what they have done and do they change their look right is that how is that accepted so I think more so it's it's the underlying things that can really really change and um, that are the problem to me um, you know, people in my experiences haven't been so open and blatant with it. Like you are not doing this because X, Y, Z, but they'll do it in the background. And that's what you have to be cognizant of. 
Absolutely. And, um, and, and touching upon uh, Ms. Franklin's uh, question, I, I know we have limited time. Um, uh, was, was you uh, covering um, the Bucks were, um, in the bubble um, uh, uh, this past uh, summer and fall? And, um, and did you cover the day where, where the Bucks um, uh, walked off the court um, in, um, in solidarity of Jacob Flake? Yes, I was, there's so many words for that day, but most of it is proud. Um, and I think that's on a personal and professional level personally, because I know so many people in that locker room and, you know, professionally they were tasked with winning basketball games and they put that on the back burner for a day and they didn't know what consequences it would have. And they said, no, this is more important and we'll deal with all the other things later. So I was just so proud. And then uh, on a professional sense, and then, you know, the Bucks as an organization to take a, a stand. I am such a firm proponent of fighting for what you believe in. And um, that's exactly what the organization and the players did. And we were on air for two and a half hours. You talk about having just to be prepared for the unknown. We went into that day going on the air like we we're going to cover a basketball game we go to a commercial break and I'll notice that nobody's on the floor so there was no heads up there was no uh inside information I mean the players didn't even know this was happening till it happened right their decision was spur of the moment this was not like a a, a predetermined thing so we just had to be able to react and, and for me I felt like my role was to give people context and background to who these players are the things they have done in the past it wasn't like this oh, all of a sudden they want to stand for something um, and work towards progress. They have been working towards progress for months and for years, and it all culminated itself in this moment where the world was watching. And so I was just kind of relaying that on air. But yeah, we were live for like two and a half hours. And it's a day that personally and professionally, I, I will never, never forget. And so proud to have witnessed it. So thank you for asking about that. Uh, absolutely. Um, with, with the Bucks uh, organization, the players, what they were able to do, um, uh, like you said, you, you didn't, they, the players themselves didn't know what ramifications was going to come their way. Uh, it was spur of the moment. Cause I believe even the Magic players were, were uh, practicing and everything. And yeah. They didn't know. So uh, everything that we did even to this very day has been a huge inspiration um, to our youth um, here in Chicago. Well, I appreciate that. And, you know, you all have my contact information. If any of the students have like follow-up questions or anything like that, if anybody's particularly interested in journalism or television and wants more information, just let me know. I'm happy to help. Definitely. Definitely. Well, Is it okay well, that I, um, I'm sorry, Ms. Oh, Coleman. Is it okay that I uh, tag you in like our Twitter? If I took a picture, is it okay if I tag you? Okay, perfect. Thank of you. Course. <laughs> and one day when this um, all passes, Coach, I'm going to have to come down there and get some shots up. And come on <laughs> down. Come on down. Yeah. <laughs> you are more than welcome. <laughs> well, well uh, who, who do the Bucks play next? They play Detroit for the third time in like two weeks tomorrow. <laughs> oh my God. Oh my God. Tell tell hometown D Rose uh, we said oh. what's up. <laughs> but, uh, the, but the next time, yeah, please don't be a stranger. Uh, we'll we'll circle back uh, with you, uh, you know, um, hopefully before the trade deadline. And please promise next time you play our beloved Chicago Bulls, take it easy on us. Don't, don't, don't pummel us by 40 like last time. <laughs> Because that was a matter last time. It was, it, it wasn't good for us. Y'all beat us by forty. Thank you again on behalf of. Um, I'm sorry. Oh, he's back. He's back. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> oh yeah. Oh yeah yeah, yeah. 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 Please take it easy on us uh, next time. <laughs> <laughs> we'll do. We'll do. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right. Have a good All right, one. Go. All right, go Buck. <laughs> Guys, thank you for joining in. Great job. Great job, Eagles. You, you guys can log off.
So, Mr. Coleman, uh, I'm Mr. sorry, Lota, I wasn't I'll the one. Send you the link after. Okay, I don't know if I didn't know about the twelve until I was looking at it. So I don't I don't know who I'm gonna have. Oh, I'll that's send tomorrow. It out there. Oh, tomorrow. Oh, praise.